So for the past several weeks, uh, Pastor Tom and I have been discussing uh, what comes next. Now that uh, we're a team of two and no longer a team of three, uh, how is it that we are going to proceed uh, forward in our time together? And so one of the things is we wanted to create some uh, theme, uh, some focus for us as a congregation uh, to join in again and kind of commit uh, to our ministry um, together. And so um, we threw out some different words and uh, brainstormed, tried to figure it out. Well, if you don't know about Pastor Tom, one of his gifts is making lists of words that all fit together. So we had words that maybe said things like receive, respond, and rejoice, but it wasn't kind of until his brain put those pieces together that those words came to be the ones that, uh, that we're using. But as, we, as we've been thinking about this, um, we're going to share with you personally some of the ways in which we receive, respond, and rejoice to how God's active in our lives. Uh, we're going to talk about it as pastors, kind of how that works as well. Um, so we'll get started with that. So Pastor Tom, the first thing that I've been thinking about, or all week, there's a prayer that's been in my mind. And the prayer I think you know, and the prayer most of the people here know well. It's the offertory prayer that was in the LBW, okay? And the reason why this prayer, I think, has been in my mind is because it reflects all three, okay? So here's the prayer. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So I know that that prayer hasn't been how you've kind of shaped your thinking about uh, receiving from God's goodness, but why don't you share how you approach that? How about now? (laughs) Oh, that's enough. I was saying, when you you quote from the old hymnal, you're bringing me back to my childhood, and those are some of the times where we learn what's fundamental. Mm -hmm. And every person in this room, including four-year-old Emmett, by the end of today, should know three words. Receive, respond, rejoice. Receive, respond, rejoice. And then some of us out there, too, might take this card and put it on our fridge, and by the end of the week might have this whole scripture from Colossians 3 memorized. That's going to be your questions, Pastor Steve, is to recite the Colossians 3 in, in the next moment. Oh, man, I'm going to fail already. But, but you're right about that prayer because, you know, so often we think we come to worship to give God our praise, to give God something, to give our offerings, give our lives. And the first thing God wants to do in worship is give to us. We can't outgive God, you know. So we show up to, to, to church with whatever we think we bring, and God is so abundant in his grace that all, we, have to, we have no choice but to respond because, you know, he doesn't stop giving. Uh, you can't get a word in edgewise in, in some sense. He's just overflowing in his grace. Um, and I was thinking about this this week because if you haven't heard, we're, we're in, and just for a minute, we're in the most important election of our lives. But that is false. Because I've heard that every four years of my life. But also because of this, this word right here, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. The most important election of your lifetime was God choosing you in Jesus Christ to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have been chosen by God. And the good news about that for me in my life is once I learned that, 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 that God wants me to receive, uh, it, opened up, it opened up everything because I realized God doesn't have to choose me. God wanted to choose me. God didn't have to put up with me and still doesn't have to put up with me. Um, You know, we say only a mother could love this person or that person. But with God, truly God wants you. He wants to call you his beloved son or daughter. And that's how I approach, you know, kind of coming to worship is we're not going to be able to outgive God. I don't know, but for you, Steve, like in your life, you know, receiving from God, uh, we've all enjoyed, you know, you you go up on Mount Pisgah and give us the weather report and then what's going on in in your heart and your thoughts that week. And I, I imagine that's one of the ways you receive God's goodness for you. Yeah. Yeah, for me, um, being out in, in God's creation is one of the ways that I get restored. Um, I jokingly call Mount Pisgah my spiritual director. Now, I've had a real physical spiritual director when I lived in uh, Illinois, 
Um, but one of the things we discovered together was that me being outside and getting to hear the birds and, and, and recognizing how creation moves around me uh, helps me to receive what God is giving. Um, even now, I can listen to books and I can still hear the birds because I have these special headphones that don't actually cover my ears, but they go into my bone here, and so I can still hear everything around me, but I can still listen to something, too, at the same time, so it's kind of neat because I don't then tune out from creation. <laughs> That's funny because my headphones tune out my family when they're trying to get my attention. Yeah. So you, I didn't know those headphones existed. I would have gladly put them on. Yeah. I can do that without headphones. So. <laughs> well, and I think I was thinking too this week about um, how we each greet people at the beginning of the service. So you tend to say, oh, holy people, good morning. Mm -hmm. And then I tend to say, good morning, Bethesda. And I, and I, and I see this actually here in our scripture. Uh, Paul says, holy and beloved, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, that you name us holy, not because we're holy, I mean, you know, uh, or because you think you're holy in and of yourself, mm -hmm. but you're naming us what Christ has named us. Yeah. And then when I say beloved, or when I say Bethesda, to me, that's like when you are in love with someone, you give them a nickname as quickly as possible. <laughs> you know, Andrea and I know that we're getting on each other's nerves if we call each other Tom or Andrea. Uh, but if we give our nicknames, then you know there's love. And so for me, when I say good morning, Bethesda, I'm saying good morning, you specific beloved people of God. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's for me, that's why I say, oh, holy people, because um, I, I know that we often come to worship and don't feel holy, uh, but God claims us as holy. God calls us holy. So why not name that as we begin our worship together? Yeah, and then Paul immediately, he goes from calling us holy and beloved to then saying, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. I'm thinking, if, I, if, I, if I'm convinced I'm holy and beloved, isn't the world going to just get tired of Tom acting righteous and well-loved and the favorite beloved child? But, so Paul immediately says, you are holy and beloved in God's eyes. But in, in your relationships with other people, it's patience, it's humility, it's bearing with one another. Um, he immediately says, this holiness and belovedness is not for your glory, <laughs> but for God's glory as you serve others. Yeah, yeah. Well, and of course, we should probably point out too in this first section of the scripture, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And I think out of all of, the, all of God's goodness that we receive, I mean, I think about my family, I think about our church, I think about, uh, you know, the goodness of God in our lives. But then I think uh, forgiveness is like the most precious good, like that we actually get a fresh start with God mm -hmm. uh, time and time again. And, and that's something that it's almost like you can take it for granted, um, you know, because uh, it, it sort of interrupts our typical way of thinking, right? All of a sudden yeah. God comes in with forgiveness, and you're like, yeah, I needed that, and I didn't yeah. know it. Yeah. I think we make the mistake, too, of, of equating our forgiveness, the way we forgive, with the way God forgives. And we all know that we hold grudges. You know, we may not forgive and forget. We may not forgive and completely release someone else. Uh, but God's promise of forgiveness does all of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's Reformation Day. And Martin Luther, when he posted those 95 theses, which was only the beginning of how radical he would become, uh, he, he, he says in there, in one of the first theses, he says, the Christian's life um, is daily repentance. When God said repent, he meant daily repent. And so what, what that says to me is, the forgiveness of God is not the first step, it's every step, and it's the final step. Uh, and, it's, and so the gospel is not just sort of what gets us in the door and then we have to figure out how to be better people, but every step of the way, God's mercy is abundant and we receive it. Mm -hmm. well, well, let's, uh, let's uh, move to the second section and of course we'll probably end up jumping back and forth. The second piece of the scripture, Paul continues with this image of clothing and he says, clothe yourselves with love which binds everything together in perfect harmony and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in the one body. So, Pastor Steve, you know, having received God's goodness and continuing to receive God's goodness, um, how do you find God drawing you to a responsive life? Yeah, well, you know, I, I said it in a sermon a couple weeks ago. I said, you know, what we receive from God is like the greatest gift ever. And what if you were then to take that gift and throw it in the back of the messiest closet in your house and forget about it? Mm -hmm. I mean, that would make no sense. We wouldn't take the greatest gift we've ever been given and hide it in our house somewhere. Um, and I think about that with, with God's goodness uh, given to us is that um, how can we not respond when we've been made holy, we've been clothed with God's love, when we've been called out into the world to be God's people? How can we not respond 
uh, to what God has done first. And, and I think, um, and I remember this from my childhood, but you know, sometimes Lutherans, we can get so, work, so caught up in the idea of works. You know, you don't want to do works for work's sake uh, because we can't justify ourselves by the things that we do. You all learn that in confirmation, right? We can't justify ourselves by the things that we do. But I think sometimes we take it so far as to think that means we don't have to do anything. Um, and that's not at all what, uh, what any of this means. And it doesn't mean what God wants for us either. So if we received from God these great gifts, then how can we not respond? And I think one of the ways, um, I mean, we show that when you go back to that first section, when we, when we show compassion, when we show kindness, when we are humble, when we're meek, when we're patient with others, that's one of the ways that we respond to God, because God has shown us those things first. And the truth is, we fall short, and we fail at those things quite often, with our spouses, with our kids, with people around us, somebody at the grocery store, somebody in the street who cuts us off, whatever it might be. We don't always respond that way first. And I think that's why we're constantly called back into this forgiveness cycle, um, because we have to keep coming back to God's forgiveness, so that when we do fall short, we can turn to God again and say, God, I tried, and I failed again. Please forgive me. And God's promise is that we will be forgiven again and again and again. It's a really fascinating time in our culture where um, you can be canceled and, you know, deplatformed and have no more voice to speak. And, and, uh, and our culture knows justice, but it doesn't know mercy or mm-hmm. forgiveness or, or how those play together where, yes, you're forgiven, but now we need to figure out a better way forward together, you know, in a, in a just way. Um, you know, I think about um, a lot of people have seen the Social Dilemma documentary on Netflix, uh, or a lot of us have been thinking for years about what are these devices doing to us and our children? Um, and, and one of the basic things that's happening with all of our media is it's, it's, it's geared to produce a response. I mean, it's designed to get you hooked. Yeah. And this has an impact on young kids, of course, but it has an impact on all of us. It's designed to give a response. So you watch something, and it's designed to get you outraged. It's, you watch something or hear something, and you, it's designed to get you anxious, so you respond with anxiety. And here, Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. In other words, of course you have uh, anxiety and fear and all the rest, but, but, but only Jesus sits in your heart. Only Jesus gets to sit on the throne and call the shots. And so that as Christians, we, we are learning by the grace of God the art of being given uh, 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 a, a stimulus that says, be outraged, be anxious, be fearful, be hate, hateful. And then we process that through the heart at the throne room of Christ, and we say, okay, where's your peace, Jesus? I need your peace. <laughs> uh, and and, and, and Jesus' peace is the one that is to rule in our hearts. Mm-hmm. Easier said than done. <laughs> right, right. Well, and I think it stands against kind of, we talk about it so much in American culture, this rugged individualism um, as soon as you recognize God's, God's power in your life, as soon as you recognize then how are we supposed to respond to that love, that individualism goes out the window pretty fast because we recognize that we have to be in relationship with others to, to, um, to experience what God is doing in the midst of us. Yeah, when Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, he says, to which you were called in the one body. Yeah. So, I mean, we all kind of enjoy a nice Saturday peace in our hearts when we're by ourselves doing exactly what we want to do with our time, but Christ has called us to peace in the body and peace in the city and peace in the family. And, yeah. Well, that's another thing. It's <laughs> yeah. a whole other challenge. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's look at this uh, last section and not to say, like I said, we might wander around some more. Uh, in this last section, Paul says, and be thankful Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Hmm. I'm going to start with me, even though I'm supposed to pass it to you. Go for it. um, this, This, to me, is the hardest part. 
um, that sometimes the, the idea of being thankful doesn't come natural. Um, I jokingly say, you know, I'm over half Norwegian, so if I kind of crack a smile, that means I'm overjoyed. Um, and those of you who kind of spend enough time around me might get that sense of humor or not. But, um, you know, so, I, so there's a way in which um, it's, hard, it's harder to be thankful because it doesn't feel like the immediate natural response that comes from who I am. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but... Yeah, na- rejoicing as a natural... It's so much easier to see what we don't have or to live in the past or in the future... Uh, you know, either what had happened or, or what we thought should have happened or what we expect. You know, and this year, you know, has really pinned everybody down where we can't make any plans for, you know, youth trips at the church next summer. You know, we, we, we're, we're kind of in the moment and we don't like the moment because we depend so much on being able to think about the future with anticipation and hope. Um, and, and, and instead, we're, we're, we're kind of, the calendar has been, you know, sort of erased in front of us uh, and we take it a day at a time. And I think um, right now, it's countercultural to be rejoicing. Right now, it's countercultural to say, and really with all these words, it is, it's going against the tide to say, we receive God's goodness day in and day out. Yes, we haven't received a second stimulus check, fine, but we receive God's goodness. And by the way, the goodness of God continues to feed people who don't have a stimulus check yet. The God's goodness continues to send the church out to respond with practical help and solutions. Um, and, and, and again, it's counterculture to say, let's rejoice. Let's find, uh, let's find God's gifts in these challenges. Um, I, I, Michael Hyatt is a leadership podcast I, I really enjoy. And he talks about anytime you have a challenge, he says, what does this challenge make possible? Because it's so easy to say what we've lost. We've, I mean, you know, everything seems different. Uh, and yet, what does this make possible? Uh, and again, for Pastor Steve and I, we felt like at least for the next few months, it's possible to simplify our life together, you know, in a way like this, and to consider again. Now, the, the state's going to tell, well, that's just, <laughs> the word essential has become very interesting this year. Um, we're going to reassert that what we do together as a people of God is essential. Um, doesn't mean that we're in the room, but it's essential that the people of God are signs of rejoicing in the world, of receiving God's goodness in all circumstances, even with suffering, and to res- continue to respond and not lose heart in the, in the life of service. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I said that if you listen to my Friday Reflections, but a few weeks ago I said, I'm done with lament. I've been lamenting now for months, and I'm done with lament. I'm moving on to something else. Uh, because I kind of recognized in myself that um, you tend to see what you're talking about. You tend to see what you're thinking about. So if, if all you're thinking about is lament, all you're going to find is lament. Um, and so why not look for things to make us joyful or, uh, or rejoice in that way? Um, I watched the documentary on Friday night because it just came out. I'm not a huge Bruce Springsteen fan, but Bruce Springsteen has a new album and it has a new documentary that goes with it. And I, if you like Bruce Springsteen, watch it because it's good. But what I loved about that whole thing is that he could balance both kind of the the truth of the past. You know, all of his original bandmates had died. He could he could handle the truth of the past, but he's he still had such a clear sense of hope for the future. And I mean, it it was I mean to me that just fits so well with what we're doing is that we cling to all of these things of the past that are, are different, that have changed, that we can't do the same way. But where is it that we find our hope for the future? And we find our hope for the future in Christ, in God, in what we do here together. Yeah. Well, and again, you know, it, it's not like you leave one word and move on to the next. So it, when, when Paul says, be thankful at the, at the beginning of that last paragraph, well, then you say, well, what if I'm not thankful? Or how do I become thankful? What's the next step to getting thankful? Well, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So again, it's receiving God's word in Christ, receiving Christ himself. As that dwells in us richly, our response is going to include rejoicing. And it's okay if there's still lament. You know, if you find lament in your heart, we, we set these things side by side, um, that Christ comes in and gives us a new song. And I think, you know, um, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Uh, at least put this on your fridge or in your Bible as a bookmark or somewhere prominent. And, and we're going to print a couple other formats for you as well. So you can have this on the same side if you need. But perhaps starting with this passage, uh, memorize this or at least try to let 
phrases from it sink into your life over the coming weeks Mm -hmm. so that Christ's word would dwell in us richly and we can uh, be reminded to to rejoice in all things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the other things we tend to do is we tend to pull out our Bible looking for the one argument to shut our enemy down. Um, And that's not letting the word of God, Christ, dwell in you richly. That's using that scripture as a weapon in a way. And so I think that's one of the things, if you see yourself like, I'm going to go to scripture and I'm going to find that one thing that shuts my enemy down, uh, then say to yourself, wait a second, am I letting these words dwell in me richly? Um, Because it means I have to take all of them. I've got to take more of them together. I can't just pull something out and make it mine. Yeah. Yeah, the word of Christ. Teach, admonish, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, how how to be thankful. Well, dwell in the word with people who can teach you uh, to grow and admonish you when the growth looks more like a weed, (laughs) and and then also to clothe that all in love and and singing uh, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Uh, so that um, the word uh, just bursts out of us in this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anything else we're, re- we're rejoicing about these days at home or in your life? Well, I mean, there's, I mean, there's lots of things, I, I guess, to rejoice about. But, um, you know, I think one of, the things, uh, one of the things I've been reading here recently is uh, Bishop Michael Curry's book. It's called Love is the Way. And the subtitle is just as good as the, the, the title. It says, Holding On to Hope in Troubling Times. And um, it's a powerful book, and I'm not through it yet because I got sidetracked for a while, and I'm, I'm coming back to it again. Um, but just that focus, once again, where we tend to put our energy, where we put our focus, we, send, we start to see those things over and over again. I always say it's like this. When you buy a new car, before you bought the car, you've never seen that car on the road before. But as soon as you buy that car, you can't help but see that car on the road. Um, There's something about it psychologically. um, And I think that applies to our faith life as well, that when we decide to focus in on love, when we decide to focus in on on rejoicing, whatever it may be, we start to have opportunities to rejoice more frequently. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that I've been rejoicing about lately is just all of the people who have been busy around here working throughout the summer, working in the last couple of weeks to make that parish hall look uh, so much different than it has in the past. Um, people using their gifts uh, to help lift up and, and uh, shape, shape this place that's been used for years um, and needed some upkeep in that way. Yeah, I, I rejoice about um, just, I think a lot of people are asking great questions these days. Um, which include questions about God and faith uh, in the midst of these hard times. And, you know, and I love that. I, on Wednesday night, um, uh, Caitlin, uh, uh, Donna Miller's granddaughter, she asked, uh, in the middle of confirmation, she asked, is it okay that I'm asking so many questions? Because my teacher at school gets mad because she can never get to all that she wants to teach because we're asking questions. I was like, Caitlin, I'd be happy if the whole thing was questions, you know, yeah. um, because it's a gift to be able to say, let's think about these things together. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, it go, and it goes all over the place. I get emails from Amber, you know, and then I get a bedtime question from Jude. You know, why did God plant the tree of the God, knowledge of good and evil in the first place? You know, I'm like, oh, I'll see you in the morning, Judah. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I just rejoice for that. It's, I, I, I love being a pastor that yeah. uh, gets to help sort of be an echo for people um, wrestling through these things. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, Besides, you know, taking this home and dwelling in it uh, and, and thinking about these things, and besides everybody, including four-year-old Emmett and five-year-old Eliza, respond, re- receive, rejoice, and respond. Um, the other thing that we want to uh, put in your ear is really do think through how you see in your life um, God's goodness, receiving God's goodness. How do you specifically see these things? Um, how do you find responsiveness in your life? Um, uh, you know, and, and, and maybe that's changed in the last few months, but, but how do you find yourself responding to God's gifts? And then again, what, what brings you joy? What, in what do you rejoice even now uh, in all of these things? And uh, it could be that in the coming weeks, uh, you are invited to have a uh, kind of like this, you know, 10 to 15 minute conversation with one of us or with a council member or someone else in which we, we talk about these three R's and then maybe we pull 
two minutes, three minutes of our conversation into a video and, and, and share it during the worship service so that we can begin to teach and admonish one another and sing, you know, we can begin to do this together um, and see how God is doing these things in your own lives. So reflect on your own, dwell in this word, and then, uh, and then return our phone calls if we uh, happen to invite you to have a conversation like this for the benefit of the one body to which we've been called. Mm-hmm. We close in prayer? Yep. Let's pray. Gracious God, we have received from you grace upon grace, and we thank you for all your gifts in Jesus who has chosen us, who has called us holy and beloved when we were neither holy nor lovable. We thank you. Help us as your church and as your people to respond to your grace with lives of service, lives that witness to your great love. And help us to be a community that rejoices in all circumstances. That yes, we are afflicted and challenged, but we are not crushed, we are not despairing. Help us to sing your songs uh, in all times. Help us to this week see your joy in our lives and to share that with others. Um, Bless us as we receive, respond, and rejoice on this Reformation Sunday. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.